Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day you've given us. I thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless and guide us as we look into your word, as we are taught. And, Lord, that you would uh, guide us, that you would empower us, that you would prepare us. And, Lord, that we would follow and we would obey. I thank you that you uh, love us so much. And I thank you for Christ who died and rose again for the greatest victory of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, January 1969, two great quarterbacks faced each other from opposite sidelines in Super Bowl III. Both Johnny Unitas and Joe Namath were raised in the still towns of western Pennsylvania, but they had grown up a decade apart and lived in different moral cultures. Unitas grew up in the old culture of modesty and humility. His father died when he was just a young boy, and his mother took over the family cold delivery business. And Unitas weighed 145 pounds while playing quarterback for his high school team. And he took a beating during every game. He went to church before every game, deferred to the authority of his coaches, and lived a football-obsessed life. After college, he had a brief tryout with the hated Pittsburgh Steelers. Be careful now. (laughs) <laughs> well, uh, that was not didn't work out. He was cut. Then he got a long shot call from the Baltimore Colts, and he made the team and spent many of his early years with the Colts, steadily losing. And United was not an overnight sensation. He he worked his way up to become uh, an effective and, and good football player, and even a Hall of Famer. He was deliberately unglamorous figure with his black high top. Sneakers, bold legs, stooped shoulders, and a crew cut above his rough face. He was loyal to his organization and his teammates. And in the huddle, he'd rip into his receivers when they ran the long, when they ran the wrong route or they did the wrong thing. And then after the game, he'd say, "No, I overthrew the guy." <laughs> in, in Steve Sable of NFL Films captured Unitas' character. He was an honest workman doing an honest job. Unitas came to embody a particular way of being a sports hero. Well, in sharp contrast, Joe Namath was a flamboyant star with white shoes and flowing hair, brashly guaranteeing victory. Broadway Joe made himself the center of attention, a spectacle off the field as much as on it. With $5,000 fur coats, long sideburns, and playboy manners, he openly bragged about what a great athlete he was and how good-looking he was. In front of the mirror, he'd say, Joe, Joe, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. And he created an early version of what would now be called the hookup culture. He told a reporter, I don't like to date as much as I like just to run into someone. He embodied the autonomy ethos that was beginning to sweep throughout the country. I believe in letting a guy live the way he wants to if he doesn't hurt anyone. I feel that everything I do is okay for me and doesn't affect anybody else, including the girls I go out with. Look, man, I live and let live like everybody else. Well, what are you doing with what God has given you? What way are you showing him and showing Christ and revealing Christ to others? How is your marriage? How are your finances? How is your mind and heart pure? What is your role as father and mother? And how are those rules and roles defined by Scripture? A lot of times when you ask these questions, it can easily be turned into a competition. You know, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Probably better than you. (laughs) And that is not the point of asking these questions. The point of asking these questions with people you trust and people you know and people you love is to keep from allowing the enemy to gain a foothold. You don't want the enemy to gain a foothold. Secrets, isolation, lack of accountability leads to Satan gaining a foothold. And what Satan wants to do when he gains a foothold is to overcome and conquer you. He wants to take not give. He wants to divide and not unite. He wants death and not life. He wants selfishness and not love. He wants individuality and not community. He wants you to look to yourself for strength, for healing, for help, for identity, for direction, for right and wrong. He doesn't want you in the word of God. He doesn't want you seeking and relying on God. He doesn't want accountability. He doesn't want holiness. So let us not just disappoint Satan. Let us defeat him. 
Let us defeat him. Let us crush him under the weight of God's holy presence and God's amazing grace. Let us expose his lies and let us expose his agenda. Let us get sweet revenge for what he wants to do to us. Let us get sweet revenge against the enemy. Well, the two men, Johnny Unitas and Joe Namath, the two men who expressed themselves very differently, as I told, as I talked about earlier, they both played football. They both were good quarterbacks. Yet what made them different is not what made them holy or unholy. It didn't matter how they lived. If they lived without Christ, they're both guilty. We're justified by Christ, not ourselves. Only in Christ can we be saved. It doesn't matter if one is humble and one is not, one is moral, one is not. We are all sinners and we all need Christ. It is a lie of Satan to think that we are in if we're good and we are out if we are bad. We're all out. And we all deserve hell. But through the grace of Christ, we are given hope, salvation. It is Christ who has made us alive. As I relayed the story of the two quarterbacks, the interesting thing is how it is presented. One is good. And one is bad. One is a hero. One is not. One is self-seeking. One is not. The reality is only in Christ are we good. And only in Christ are we saved. And only in Christ are we set free. Only in Christ can sin have no effect. Only in Christ and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It is a gift of God. My goodness and acceptance all come from him, not from me. It does not rely on me. In fact, I must rely continually on God. I'm just a regular guy relying on Jesus every day. (laughs) I do not know the spiritual conditions of these two men, but I do know this in Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The first verse we can never overcome on our own, but the second verse shows us how we can. The second verse shows how we can. The enemy is real and his efforts are real, but Christ has and continues to overcome. Christ is our freedom. He is our hope. I want you to know today, Christ is our life. Christ is our life. Christ is our life in all that we do. He is our life in our work. He is our life in our homes. As we parent, as we husband, as we wife. Those are verbs. As we deal with finances, as we read scripture, as we spend time of refreshing, Christ is our life. He's our hope and our freedom. He is our holiness and our righteousness. He is our walk, our community, our vision and a passion. Christ is our life. Well, Matthew 25, Jesus is in Jerusalem. The time leading up to his death and resurrection are quickly and rapidly about to happen. He has faced overwhelming criticism. He is now pronouncing judgment on the religious leaders. And in Matthew 24, he spoke candidly of the fall of Jerusalem that will take place in a few decades. He's talked about his return and he talked about remaining watchful and faithful. And then he gives parables that relate to the theme of watchfulness and faithfulness. And they're also parables of judgment. So in Matthew 25, Jesus spoke of the parable of the loaned money or the talents in verse 14. So first point here, God gives. God gives. Let's look at verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Well, when missionaries Tom and Mabel Wiley arrived in the village of El Valle, Panama, they moved into a mud hut and a thatched roof, with a thatched roof and a mud floor. Well, Tom was off and out about meeting with people, talking to them, doing Bible studies. Uh, Mabel found herself stuck at home, the center of attention of various villagers who examined her curiously. The wily children would come home from playing covered with little brown insects, which Mabel removed only with great difficulty and a lot of kerosene. 
Well, one evening after the children had been put to bed, Mabel was overcome with emotion. She ran outside, sat down on an old stump and complained to the Lord. Lord, all I ever wanted was a beautiful home. Is this my beautiful home? This thatched roof, this mud floor and creatures falling from the ceiling. And what about my children? Can I bear this for them? Kneeling by the stump, she continued weeping and praying. And suddenly the Lord seemed to speak to her. He asked her, can you not live in this mud hut for me? Remember what I've done for you. Mabel's heart was touched and she remembers the many blessings and gifts of love she had continually received from the Lord's hand. Yes, Lord, she prayed. I can live in this mud hut for you. I give you my desires for a beautiful home, my children, my husband, all of this to you. Do with me as you will. She later recalled, suddenly peace surrounded me. I rose from my knees and at that mud hut might have been a mansion since my Lord had placed me there. It took it altogether different to my eyes. I saw what could be done to make it a home. Christ gave me new eyes. Christ is our life first observation god gives us his all god gives us his all well as we look at this parable of the of the talents being given out it's an interesting parable and it's similar to the one that you read in luke 19 about the 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 mean is not the talent Uh, there are distinct differences between the luke 19 and the matthew 25 but they have the similar type of message with the third servant in luke 19 even though there's 10 servants getting these uh, minas, if you will. Uh, But the third one hides it just like the one here in Matthew 25. In this parable uh, in Matthew, this man is said to go, has given out the money and then he goes on a long journey and he will then return. But as he prepares to leave, he gives his life existence. It's very interesting. Life existence to his slaves. There are only three slaves that he gives them to. This man has considerable wealth as a talent would be a significant amount of worth, just one talent would be. And he's got at least eight. (laughs) In the NIV, it says he entrusted his property to them. As you look there, he entrusted his property to them. Verse 14, he was turning over his very livelihood to them. The word for property is the word that is used to mean existence or to be. So this man is turning over his very existence, if you will, to his slaves. And that is why he's entrusting it to them. Well, as Christ is telling this parable, he's speaking about the kingdom of heaven again. If you look at 25 verse 1, it says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like. And then in verse 14, he says, again, it will be like. And the word it there is referring back to verse 1, the kingdom of heaven. Well, throughout most of Christ's parables that we have looked through, Christ has talked about value, importance, priority, and obligation. The soils received the word, and they all had a different reaction to the word. The discovered treasure and the merchant looking for pearls, the weed and the wheat, the vineyard workers and the wedding banquet all speak similarly to the necessity of what is truly valuable and important to God. So important that it is so easily missed by us, even those of us who may be steeped in the history of God's word. When you think of it, what is the most valuable possession, if we can use those terms, that God has? What is so precious to God? His son. His son is the most precious thing to God. His greatest and most valuable of all that he could give. The greatest treasure is Christ. The finest pearl. His words are valuable. His presence is a priority. His wedding is the top of his list. And when I see that this man gave his existence, it's like God giving us Christ. I give you Christ. That is what he gave us. He gave us Christ. Christ, he gave us his all. He gave us his very existence, his very being. Christ is our life. Christ is our very existence. And the word for property in 2514 is similarly, is the same word used in Matthew 19. Let's go to Matthew 19. Start with verse 16. Very interesting here. In Matthew 19, verse 16, it says, Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? 
Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man replied. Jesus replied, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now when the man said, or excuse me, when Jesus said, Go sell your possessions. It's the same word here in Matthew 25. Go sell your very livelihood, your very existence. Go sell everything that gives you identity, that gives you your hope, gives you your trust, that gives you your comfort. Sell it all. And then come follow me. Then come follow me. What you believe gives you excuse me, your existence. Instead, know that Christ gives you existence. Know that Christ gives you hope. Christ gives you a future. Sell it all and follow me. I am your very life. That's what Jesus was saying. You know, as I read this parable, I see that God is giving us Christ. It's like God giving us Christ. He's giving us the very person who matters to him. I'm reminded of Romans 8, where we read, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I'm reminded of John 3, that well-known verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave us his all. Christ is our life. Secondly, know the value of what is given. Know the value of what is given. The man going on a journey gives the talents to his slaves based on his knowledge of the slaves. He go, then he goes on a journey. He knows the risk of giving the talents to his people. He knows that he could lose what he has given them. But to him, it is worth the risk. What this says is that you and I are worth the risk in what he has entrusted to us. He desires to pour Christ into you and me. Now, the word talent can, can refer to a unit of measurement, can refer to gold. It can refer to silver, even copper. A talent referred to a measurement of weight. Uh, It could weigh between 60 and 80 pounds. The talent was also worth uh, 6,000 denarii. One denarius was uh, a day's wage. And so a day laborer would have to work roughly 15 years to earn a talent. (laughs) It's a long time. And if you took today's gold prices, which is close to 1,200 per pound, um, what that would mean is if you say you had a talent, and let's say you have the, it's worth 70 pounds, that would be equivalent to $84,000. So a talent is quite a lot of money. And the first slave received five talents, the second two talents, and the third one talent. And so even one talent is quite a bit of money or quite a bit of value. And we're told what the first and second one did. They went out and they doubled their talents. The third hid his. He hid his master's money. Now, the parable does not tell us that the man who gave the talents told them or commanded them to go and double it. It Didn't say that. Only that they did do that. They took it and then they went and did it. It is possible they set up some business and they worked with the capital to make the money grow. Obviously, it worked. Now, uh, again, the parable does not tell us if the man who gave the money gave any commands, but the parable does, uh, he, and he does not tell us the man saying, go and double the money. <laughs> Don't say that. Now, it's implied he did, because that's the reaction of the, the two slaves. They took the money and they went and doubled it. The first two slaves understood the value of what they were given. They wanted many people to experience the value of what they'd be given. And through that experience, they were able to grow the, the worth of what they were given. In the same way, we have been given Christ. And what are we doing with what we have been given? How many times do we make sure people see and experience Christ? How are you living your life today that is reflecting Christ? Are your minds pure? Are your actions holy? Are you seeking the will of God or your own selfish gain? What are you doing with what God has given you? 
Remember, Christ is our life. Number two, God expects. God expects. Let's look at verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Well, Robbie Robbins was an Air Force pilot during the first Iraq war. And after his 300th mission, he was surprised. I don't know why. He was surprised to be given permission to go uh, to immediately pull his crew together and fly home. He, he, was, he was done. So he, he got to go home. Well, they flew across the ocean to Massachusetts, and then they had the long drive to Pennsylvania. They drove all night, and when his buddies dropped him off at his, at his home just be, after sunup, there was a big banner across the garage that said, Welcome home, Dad. Now, he hadn't said anything. He hadn't talked to anyone. How did they know? No one had called and the crew themselves hadn't expected to leave so quickly. And Robin relates, when I walked into the house, the kids about half dressed for school screamed, Daddy! Susan came running down the hall. She looked terrific, her hair fixed, makeup on, and a crisp yellow dress. How did you know? I asked, said the pilot. I didn't, she answered through tears of joy. Once we knew the war was over, we knew you'd be home one of these days. We knew you'd try to surprise us, so we were ready Every day. We were ready every day. The, how are we living our lives? Are we ready every day for Christ? The first two servants lived in readiness every day. The third, not so much. First observation, there will be a delay. We do see that the man goes on this long journey. There's a long time between the time he gives the talents to the time that he returns. There will be a delay. In these parables that Jesus is speaking and the ones he has spoken do include a delay or a time gap. In a lot of these parables that he's speaking, ten, uh, the ten virgins, the wise and foolish ones, there's a delay. And then the bridegroom arrives. Well, in, in, in this parable, he returns. And when he returns, he wants to settle accounts. He wants to see what they have done. He wants to see what has happened. The first two had doubled their money. But as you see, this took a lifetime to do this. It took a lifetime for them to double their talents. It did not happen overnight. There will be a delay. There will be a lifetime before an account has to be given. Similarly, in the first parable of this chapter, the wise and foolish bridesmaids had to wait for the arrival of the bridegroom. In the weeds and the wheat, there was a time to wait while the wheat and weeds matured. The merchant looked for a long time for the right pearl. The delay of Christ's coming is so we can live in a state of readiness, saying, I am ready, Lord. Each day I'm ready. The first and second slaves showed to the master that they have doubled what they were given. The master then praises and blesses them. He used the terms good and faithful. You've been faithful in the sense that you were ready. Faithful is ready. Faithful meaning that this person always had the master on his mind. We always have Christ on our mind. Each day they had a goal. They worked and saw their destiny. Christ is my destiny. Christ is my goal. You see, today we're to live that way. We're to reflect on Christ. We're to have Christ on our minds. We're to say, Christ is my destiny. We're to seek him each day. Christ is my work. He's my goal, my destiny. He's my very being. We get up each morning calling out to Christ. We live each day saying, Lord, I want to fulfill what you've called me to do. There will be a delay, but that delay is not an excuse to make us lazy, but an opportunity to reveal God's heart, who is Christ. It is an opportunity to be used of him for whatever he may mean me to do and be. When the delay is over and the Lord has returned, he will ask, what have you done with what I've given you? What have you done? Faithfulness is the key word here. The slaves who were faithful took what was given and doubled it. Faithfulness is love. 
Faithfulness is commitment. Faithfulness is a lifestyle. The next key phrase is come and share your master's happiness. Literally, it means come and share your master's joy. Your master's joy. Come and enter into the master's joy. The master's joy is the kingdom of heaven. It is the presence of God. It is a celebration of all that God has done. The kingdom of heaven is the reward. It is the reality of truth. It is the end of this age and the truth of the age to come. The presence of Christ is the reward. The presence of Christ is the proof of faithfulness. Faithfulness is linked to joy. Faithfulness is the character of God and his attitude toward us. He is and has been faithful to you and me. Because of that, his joy is what we can know today. In John 15, Jesus said this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And also in John 17, he says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in this world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Now, Christ wants his people. He wants you and me to experience his joy, the fullness of his joy. What kind of joy does Christ have? Imagine that. Can you measure it? Can you describe it? Can we understand it? Is there words that can capture in describing the joy that Jesus has? Well, God wants us to know that joy. He wants us to enter into that joy. He wants us to experience that joy. And I guarantee you, it is wonderful. It is to be known. That is the privilege of hearing and knowing and hearing those words enter into your Lord's joy. So Christ is our life. Number three, God reveals. God reveals. Let's look at verse 24. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that, what, that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he, who, he will have in abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, in the parable, the master comes to the third slave and the slave immediately tells him how bad of a guy the master is. <laughs> tells him, you're no good. You're a hard man. The slave is saying that he's grasping and exploiting the labors of others. You get to eat food that you did not plant and you get to gather food that you did not plant. You, you are exploiting other people. Why should I make you wealthy and not receive anything out from it? Here's your talent. And he gave him back what was given to him. No more, no less. In fact, he had taken it and risked. And had he taken it and had he risked it and had he lost, he would have incurred the wrath of the master anyway. Here, take it. First observation. God is calling us to risk. You know, in the ancient world, when Jesus was speaking this parable, most of the people would have identified with the third guy and they would not have thought that what he had done was wrong. Why did he do something wrong? After all, he returned the talent. Nothing was taken. Nothing was ga gained. Why would he be the bad guy? Now, in terms of comparison, when it comes to the three, he was the most pathetic. He didn't do anything with it. He did nothing out of sight, out of mind. It didn't matter to him. This was out of sight, out of mind, taken away, and then he could do his own thing. It was not important to the slave. And when the Lord returns, this man blames his master. Well, you're just a bad guy, a rotten to the core. <laughs> not only does he blame the master, though, he's afraid. He's afraid. He says, so I was afraid and I hid the talent. He was afraid because he saw his master's heart and he saw his master with no grace. He did not want to disappoint, so he hid the talent. Nothing bad will happen if I just hide it. You know, we look at fear and when it shows up, it's interesting. For first time we hear of it is in Genesis 3. It says, I heard you. This is Adam speaking. He says, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 
So he was he sinned, he isolates, and then he hides. <laughs> you know, he's hiding and he's afraid. He, he's afraid. The first time we hear we hear this in the garden, I was afraid. Fear can come from sin, and sin does not, and sin produces fear. You know, it's also interesting when Jesus healed the, the man with a thousand demons and when he's healed and, the, and he's of clear mind and he's sitting there and the people come in from the town, it says, and they became afraid when they saw him. Fear can be a lack of trust. It can be a failure. It can be the unknown. We can be afraid of failure. We can be afraid of the unknown. Uh, and so when you're afraid, are you willing to risk? Are you willing to risk? You know, in the ancient world, the Jewish leaders were preserving the word of God. They were persevering with the word of God. They were preserving the word of God, the Torah, the law. It was their future. It was their hope. It was their identity. Then Jesus comes along and says, follow me. Listen to me. Obey me. I'm showing you God. I'm showing you the Father. And to the religious leaders, they felt they had to make a choice between God's word and Christ, not knowing that they are one and the same. To the religious leaders, they were given the Torah. They were given God's word to protect and preserve. And Christ is saying, I don't want you to protect it. I want you to risk it. I want you to use the words of God and tell everyone. I want you to risk my word and see it grow. People will be transformed. Lives will be changed. Marriages will be healed. Children will obey. Worshipful hearts will happen. Pure minds and pure bodies will take place. Christ is showing that what you thought God called you to do instead, he expects you to risk it, risk everything, risk your life, put it on the line. Say, God, use me, throw me out there, risk it all. Because will God's word return void? God's word will not return void. We risk it. We do not live in fear, but in trust and faith. We risk our lives. We risk our comfort. We risk our dreams. We do not bow down to the altar of me first, but to the person of Christ who gave us everything because Christ is our life. Number two, there is a future. Now, as we read this parable, we see that the last guy lost his future. He has no future place in the kingdom. The first two get a future. The future is in the risk. Faith is risk. Christ is the risk. The world will persecute you, will make fun of you, will mock you, but we uphold Christ anyway. The man who had the talent did so at the expense of his future. It was not to be preserved, but to be used. The talent is removed and given to the first man. This last man is removed and thrown into hell. A few things we learn here. The talent to this slave, this third slave, was not a priority. As he, when the minute he hit it in the ground, out of mind, out of sight. Doesn't matter to me. I will do nothing with it. Just put it away. And also, we realize that the talent, the things that God gives us, who Christ is, he is offensive to the world, but we give him anyway. And we also see that God is holy and his wrath is real. And God has, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, shown his grace and his mercy to us. But his wrath is real. And God is holy. Benjamin Kwashi, a Christian leader from Nigeria, tells the following story of how the gospel came to his part of the country, Nigeria. He says that missionaries came to his home in Nigeria in 1907. One of them was a man named Reverend Fox, and Reverend Fox was a professor at Cambridge University. And when he arrived, his walk with Christ was so deep that he led many people to Christ very quickly. He founded a church and moved about 10 kilometers away from the hometown of this man, Benjamin, who is telling this story. And he founded a church there, this Reverend Fox did. And, and here was this guy from England coming down into this area and he's preaching Christ and people are coming in and just following Christ and giving their lives to Christ. So many so that he has to write his brother, who's a doctor in England, and says, help, come and help me. And so his brother uh, makes the journey to help him in Nigeria. And as he's on his way from England to Nigeria, Reverend Fox fell ill and died. And soon after his brother arrived, he also fell ill and died. 
Well, the church mission society wrote to their father, who was also a pastor. And when they told him he had lost two sons, he and his wife, of course, were very, dis- were very sad. They cried. They wept. And, but then they did something. And they sold all their land and property and took the proceeds to the mission society and said, here, take it all. We grieve the loss of our sons, but we will be consoled by knowing that their work will continue on. And they gave that money and walked away. Well, the guy named Benjamin from Nigeria, as he was thinking and talking about this, he, says, he said this. Recently, I looked through the profile of these two missionaries who came to my hometown. They both had first-class educations and degrees from the best schools. They died as young men. The oldest was only 32. They gave up everything to serve Jesus and bring the gospel to my country. Were they crazy? No. They had heard what Jesus had said. They believed it, and they were willing to stake their whole lives on the truth of of Christ's words. These men wanted to end their lives well, no matter how long or short their life. It wasn't going to be wasted, but they would invest it for eternity. They risked it. Christ is our life. Let us pray. Father God, I know that I confess to you that my heart at times wants to have comfort. And it seeks it. And not to take risks and not to risk it. Lord, I want to risk everything for you. Because you gave everything to me. So Lord Jesus... Come and fill me and cover my heart. Come and fill the hearts and minds here today. And may we be a community that risks and does all that we can to show Christ. Does all that we can to give glory to Christ and to honor Christ. I thank you. And may we never, may we never take for granted what we have because of the cross. In Jesus' name.